Hello. Thanks very much for having me, and I apologize for, uh, for not being able to be there. Um, so, uh, and thanks to Sarah also for changing my slides. Thank you, Sarah. So, I was going to talk about, uh, about drug prices, but uh, then, of course, I realized that uh, drug prices are confidential, at least the prices the National Health Service pays are confidential. So, I can tell you that we, we are observing an upward trend. I can tell you that we're trying our best in, in Britain to get uh, a better deal, and I'll talk a little bit about how we go about doing that. But I can't tell you what um, what the, the trends are, and I can't give you any uh, decent evidence. So you have to rely for that. The really good work that um, American colleagues uh, do, like like Dr. Bax, who's, who's there today. So I apologize for that. So can we go to the next slide? So why are drug prices going up? Well, I think there are at least two reasons. On one hand, because people claim, and, and it's, it's certainly true that it does cost a lot of money. To develop a, a, a product, so it costs a lot to do the research. Calypso. Hello, can you hear me? I'm sorry, can I interrupt you? This is Barry Fortner. Um, the audio folks think you may be a touch close to the mic. If you could just back off just a bit and and let us see if it improves the quality of the sound. Sure. Is this better? Yes, it is. Thank you. Right. Thank you. So, uh, with slide two, uh, why are drug prices going up? On one hand, it's because it costs a lot to develop a drug. We all know that. On the other hand, uh, I would argue it's because uh, there's very little uh, control on the, on the demand side. So, there's money out there both to fund uh, drug development or to bet on, on, on a blockbuster model. Uh, but there's also a lot of money out there to pay for drugs, and um, I would argue that the U.S. market is uh, perhaps doing us all a disservice by uh, being a bit too lenient when it comes to, to paying for new pharmaceutical products. And then there's, of course, a disconnect between return on investment and what investors consider upstream when they invest in the product and value for money, which is a notion that's mostly uh, related to uh, downstream payers when it comes to actually paying for the product. So um, I was reading this Forbes interview uh, uh, by uh, Dr. Collins, and I, I was fascinated, of course, and I think he makes a very uh, uh, good point there that um, it's really, we're faced with a high failure rate, and, uh, and therefore the cost of success is very, very high. And the question then is whether such a cost plus model whereby we pay uh, more because it costs more to develop uh, and we pay for failures, combined with the difficulty of having very few players in the market really developing these very expensive and risky innovative products, ends up encouraging inefficiency rather than innovation. So the next uh, slide, slide number four. Um, I must say we're fascinated in, in the UK and Europe in general to see uh, CMS trying to uh, to control prices, to improve efficiency through, for example, allowing um, identifying a preferred products within a class um, and not being able to do so. And the next one, um, it turns out that um, uh, policymakers were against it, and next again, CMS had to drop proposals. And, and by the way, of course, as you all know, these proposals did not dare go near. Uh, um, drugs for, for cancer. So they were about other drug classes. So the next one. In the UK and in Europe, payers are pushing back, as you know, in other countries. I work mostly internationally. We do a lot of work with the government of China. We do a lot of work uh, with governments in, in Middle Eastern countries mostly, and they're very much worried about drug prices and trying to control the, uh, the trend. Uh, next one. This is just to give you some examples from the UK, most recently looking at a breast cancer drug where mice uh, deemed to be not cost effective. Uh, we estimated that it would cost about £90,000 per quality adjusted, uh, per, per patient, I'm sorry, to provide the drug, and the cost per quality adjusted life year was way above our threshold. The next one, and this triggered something which I think is happening increasingly now, and it's very um, very promising in a sense. It triggered a reaction in the press and also by charities, not just against um, uh, the death panel, as you may be known in, in, in the US, but also questioning perhaps the uh, way prices were set for this product. And this is from the, from the BBC.
And the next one is a, an article that appeared uh, in April this year in The Guardian, The View of a Cancer Patient, uh, who is also a columnist in The Guardian. And just at the bottom, you can see her quote saying that uh, though the treatment was ghastly, um, uh, the patient was rather uh, pleased in a sense that um, um, she was in a large room with other people also getting the treatment rather than in a small room, otherwise empty, because all the money was being spent on that single patient. So that's what NICE has to think about, she says, and the number of people that can be helped, not just the absolutely best way of helping one individual. So I guess it's also a different culture of living in a system that's uh, tax-funded. Not that the CMS, of course, is not tax-funded. Nevertheless, a system whereby we, we all contribute to it and we all expect to uh, benefit from it. And uh, this is the view of uh, the biggest uh, cancer charity in the UK, Cancer Research UK. Uh, this was from an, invited, an inquiry in the House of, Par uh, House of Commons, the Parliament. Uh, this submitted evidence by the charity, uh, specifically looking at the role of NICE uh, and access to drugs, cancer drugs. Uh, and the quote, as you can see, is relatively supportive and acknowledges the difficulties of operating within finite resources NICE does a relatively good job, and um, as we're moving towards value-based pricing in the NHS, and I'll talk about this in a minute, um, expanding NICE's remit also to include social care makes it all the harder to make these trade-offs, these choices. So I'm going to, um, the next slide, slide number uh, nine, um, show you a quote from an interview uh, by Bill Gates, um, in the Washington Post, in fact, he's given another one a few months ago, Rolling Stone magazine, where in both cases, I guess perhaps following his experience working uh, internationally, acknowledges the fact that trade-offs need, need to be made. Uh, and society has to deal with that reality, and we need to be explicit about that. So a very sobering view, I think, from, from a very rich American. So slide number 10. I, I guess my question, and I've got uh, another two slides like that, just uh, posing throughout the, the, my presentation, to think about what would this, what does this mean for the United States and the way the system operates there, and I had the privilege of spending about a year at Johns Hopkins a few years back. So I would say that one a, a country setting a system would need the political, professional, and the general public backing to manage these trade-offs and to ensure, to try and ensure access given the prices. And my question is whether this environment exists in the United States and how one can build such support. I guess meetings like the one you're holding today would contribute towards that trend. And is there an institution in the United States which perhaps can drive and lead on that movement of explicit priority setting? Is the fact that you're expanding coverage to ensure more and more people in the U.S. this access hook which would drive some form of open priority setting as more and more people gain access to the care they, they need. Next slide, um, and next again. So I'll talk a little bit about NICE. You talk a lot about patient-centeredness in the United States, um, certainly in the context of PCORI, which I think is a fine institution, uh, and we're all looking forward to uh, using free riding on the research results that it produces uh, from the generous funding it's getting. And this is how, I guess, we define patient-centeredness in, in the NHS. Next. So we've got a constitution in the National Health Service. Great Britain doesn't have one, but uh, the Health Service does. And that constitution, amongst other things, says, first of all, that you have the right to access drugs and treatments that NICE recommends. So unlike the, uh, perhaps the perception that oh, constantly Russian care and say no, um, what we do try to do is make sure everybody gets access to the things we do recommend. And the second bullet, I think, is important also. It says that um, when a decision is made locally, because a lot of the decisions are made locally and very few are made nationally by NICE, then at least what you're entitled to as a patient is uh, an explanation, an explanation as to how this decision was made. So a decision may be negative. It may be that you cannot access something, but it's important that the health service, the provider, explains uh, why that is. So next. So... I mentioned the curious case of cancer, and it's curious. It's curious because uh, it gets a lot of emphasis here in the UK. Uh, we've got an, a series of policies. I'm just going to mention one or two, but it's a series of policies specifically targeting trying to improve access to cancer drugs. 
um, and it's a matter of time and effort in trying to ensure that in the next one. And one of those policies was introduced uh, with a new government. It was part of the manifesto of the coalition government, and it's known as the Council of Drugs Fund. It's a fund that effectively allows individual cases uh, to be considered, even when NYSA said no to a drug, cancer drug, uh, there's a possibility that on a case-by-case -case basis, a clinician, the patient can get access to that product. And uh, it's caused a lot of uh, discussion here, of course, because the point is in the National Health Service, we're very keen to ensure that everybody gets access to the same thing. There's no variation. And the Cancer Drugs Fund has introduced variation, both geographical and, of course, across different diseases. So our Secretary of State, the Minister of Health, if you like, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, descended on national TV, the Cancer Drugs Fund, and his argument was, cancer is our number one killer. So the next slide, we're on slide 15, just to make sure the right spot. So uh, the next um, uh, click, sorry, Sarah, just to bring up the quote by NHS.UK, uh, the NHS website, which describes coronary heart disease, of course, as the biggest killer. Um, certainly above cancer. And the next click, but we, we all know there is no heart disease fund. So, so why that is? Why, why, why um, are we putting our resources into cancer? Uh, why is cancer so special? It's certainly not because uh, on the basis of need. It's not the number one killer, certainly not in the UK. So the next one. So that's an interesting one because uh, every policy that the, um, is launched in the UK uh, by government uh, has to be accompanied by a pretty standardized um, impact assessment. And this is a quote from that impact assessment for the Cancer Drugs Fund. And you can see that basically civil servants who uh, did the background reading, this is all in the, back, in, in, in the public domain, uh, pointed out that um, there's, there is, there's no evidence uh, for prioritizing cancer above other severe conditions, or indeed for prioritizing cancer drugs above any other interventions for cancer. So, for example, we know that radiotherapy, for instance, is, is, is an area where we could invest a lot more and we could get a lot more in return. Um, but nevertheless, our emphasis in the UK is on new cancer drugs. So the next one, Sarah. And again, another click. This is from a study uh, that... Um, looked into uh, public support for prioritizing cancer over other conditions. And the next one, just to give you a quote, you can see the reference at the bottom. It was published recently in Health Economics. Uh, a large survey which found that um, the majority of the people were not in favor of prioritizing one disease over another. The fair allocation was a very important consideration, and specifically for cancer, when people were asked, there was no general support uh, over other conditions. And there's more research like this, and I'm very happy to give you the reference, some of which was, uh, in fact, commissioned uh, in conjunction with NICE and the work we're doing with our academic uh, partners. So I guess bringing the next slide, slide 18, bringing us back to the question of trade-offs. So uh, is, it, is it true, is, is, is it the case that the majority of the Americans, those that are interested in, in health, and most of us are, are really most worried about the potential of the death panel than they are uh, bothered by having to deal with the bureaucracy of health insurance. Um, is it really a non-starter or third priority setting, a process for making these trade-offs open? And, and if there's a possibility that uh, perhaps priority setting is an option, is there a platform for enlisting the public's views, the media, the press, the research organizations, um, about what they think about priorities for spending in healthcare. So the next one, I'm finishing the next, ne next couple of minutes. I just wanted to uh, mention to you a very, very recent, very new development, policy development in the UK, um, following a lot of ups and downs. The government uh, assigned NICE the responsibility of um, what is now called value-based assessment, which will inform uh, value-based pricing. Um, and as part of this attempt, there's going to be a lot of changes, perhaps also in the Cancer Drugs Fund. But uh, what we're trying to do, and we're currently consulting on this, is we're trying to introduce uh, some factors that would, uh, that would allow the committees that make the decisions at NICE to uh, have some discretion 
uh, when it comes to assessing the value of pharmaceutical products, the incremental value of pharmaceutical products. And uh, we've come up with two attributes. One is the burden of illness, or the, the severity, if you like, of the disease uh, to encompass our premium for end of life. And this is a proportional shortfall in quality adjusted life years. And the second one is the wider societal benefit. And for that, as a, as a metric, we propose to use the absolute quality adjusted life year shortfall. Uh, and that is a proxy for productivity. Now, I'm not going to go into detail, but basically we're proposing to put extra emphasis and, and give a premium to drugs that uh, address very severe conditions. People are close to the end of their lives and also to drugs that uh, um, address conditions that are mostly, mostly affect young people, younger people. And I'll give you an example of the next slide, slide 20. Uh, you can see that uh, metastatic prostate cancer who affects mostly older people, uh, uh, but it's a severe condition and uh, uh, lethal condition, gets a proportional quality loss percentage of 94% and an absolute quality loss of 13 quality. Whereas osteosarcoma, a disease of younger people, an average age of 14, a proportional quality loss of 48%, uh, attacking people early on in their lives, but um, um, a, an absolute quality loss because of the uh, early age of onset of 31, as compared to the 13 of metastatic prostate cancer. So basically, the idea is to try and, and do two things, both to uh, give weight to conditions that kill you, um, or other drugs that tackle those conditions, and also uh, drugs that uh, tackle conditions that affect the very young. Now, this is my, my penultimate slide, the next one, slide 21. I didn't go without um, uh, debate, and there's still a lot of debate in the UK, and a couple more clicks, Sarah, just to bring up uh, the latest headlines of January this year. Uh, people worrying that this means that we, we, we um, discriminate against the elderly to put weight on, on diseases of the younger, and another click, again, the same worry. So, um, slide 22, next slide. Is there a way to link reimbursement to value in the United States? Are you doing it already, perhaps? And I'm looking forward to the discussion, and the speakers to follow. Uh, we've been reading about the WellPoint initiative of uh, allocating about $350 per patient to doctors who follow protocols. The United Health Work, a bundled payment linked to pathways of care. And I think these are really innovative, really, really good initiatives, I would argue. And then my question is, could CMS follow the example of private payers and, and the reverse as well? Could insurers achieve anything at all without CMS leading the way? So I'll leave you at slide 23 with a view, a quote from our citizens' council, it's like a citizens' forum, a group of, uh, of people taxpayers, representatives of the uh, general population in England and Wales. And we asked them, we said to them, should we weigh qualities? Should we try and, and, and come up with a formula? Um, and uh, they said that they thought formulas are complicated things in general. And they would rather give the appraisal committees more flexibility to deliberate, to discuss. They would not wish to see a mathematical or formulaic approach to this difficult task of making the trade-offs. And my final click, Sarah. Um, so I, I really don't think formulas are the solution, and being transparent and mathematical about things can, can also drive you to the opposite end. Um, and I really look forward to the rest of the, um, the presentations and the discussion. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Calypso. Our next speaker will be Bruce Gould, a practicing medical oncologist who will be talking about the changing profile of the cancer delivery system, consolidation of private practice into health systems.